Hi everyone, thank you for joining. So uh, I'll just let more people join in and then we'll start our webinar. Uh, thanks so much for joining and attending. Uh, so we have Rohit and Akmal joining us today and who will assist us with the webinar and I hope you guys enjoy. So hello and welcome everyone to our webinar, how to do knowledge craft rag with single store. My name is Yukti and I'll be your moderator today. One of my main jobs here at Single Store is to we organize weekly AI webinars. We organize two or three webinars per week. We demonstrate data and AI use cases, different tools and technologies, or anything that's on demand, trending, and is just uh, really in demand for. Them. Great, thank you very much, uh, Rohit, for that. Uh, so I, I promised just two slides and then uh, we'll hand it over to Rohit who will we'll go deep dive into the technical stuff. So this is just to give you a little bit of a sense in terms of single store, the company and where we've come from. So as you can see, the timeline shows that uh, we go back actually quite a few years, 2011, founded as MemSQL. Okay, so this was both the name of the product and the name of the company, focusing very much on in-memory processing, OLTP. And for speed and performance, I mean, it, it was uh, really um, there for quite some time. Uh, over the last couple of years, added support for uh, columnar storage, analytics, and um, vectors as well. Okay, so if you're sharp-eyed, you'll look at the timeline for 2017 in the middle, middle there, vectors and semantic search support. So we've had that capability for a little while now, and it's been used by customers actually, uh, you know, in, in anger, uh, actually building applications. Um, so overall, in terms of uh, number of customers, I think Rohit, if you just, uh, it should uh, bring up, there we go. So we are now a US dollars, 100 million plus annual recurring revenue, ARR. And as you can see, roughly between 2017, 2018, the uh, revenue started to increase uh, significantly there. And in terms of customers, there over 350 global customers. I, I was asked a question, and I and I mention this often now because it sort of stuck in my mind. Someone asked, "Is that 350k customers?" I'm not quite. <laughs> we will get there at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future. But those are uh, many of those are like Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies. You know, large corporations as well. And if you look along the bottom in terms of the investors, you can see well-known names uh, globally. Some of those are actually our customers as well. Uh, okay, next slide, please, Rohit. So uh, this is a, a nice kind of slide, just summarizes essentially what the product is because we get asked this quite frequently. So at its heart now, with both the OLTP and the OLAP, is this concept of universal storage, okay? So a single table type that can handle both of these uh, requirements. Um, and then on the left-hand side, um, there we go. Fast ingest CDC, so a variety of data sources. This is not exhaustive, okay? These are just some of the possibilities. So Kafka, for example, or if you're working with Apache Spark, and we have covered these in past webinars where we've uh, you know, actually shown the integrations with these technologies, or maybe even simple things like S3 or Hadoop HDFS. And the animation there, uh, I think, really shows the uh, pipelines, the ingest, okay, in parallel at scale, and be able to get large quantities of data in from these external sources into single store for processing. And that could be processing that you keep the data um, if you want to store it for the long term, or it might be just simply taking events, for example, uh, you know, logging some kind of uh, analytics upon those and then just uh, discarding the data that might be possible as well. Uh, and then we, we work on all three major cloud platforms, as you can see, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, uh, and uh, I'm sure Rohit will tell you which uh, of those platforms he plans to use uh, today. I tend to use AWS a lot simply because, uh, uh, you know, we I think it's the most robust of the three, although all three are absolutely fine in terms of usability, uh, but AWS is the one that I'm most familiar with. Uh, we run on-prem as well, and uh, there is a, a license key that you can obtain in the portal, okay, which is the, the link that Yukti will share with you. If you register, create an account, uh, you have the opportunity to uh, install your own four-node version free of charge wherever you want on-prem in the cloud. Uh, it's entirely up to you. There's a Docker container as well if you want to run something small scale. Seriously, though, using a web-based approach and going for one of those options in the portal 
is really the easiest and quickest way to get started. Nothing to install locally. And Yukti already mentioned the free tier, which we've had for a little while, and it's improving over time, getting better and better. Um, it, on the right-hand side, you can see the stored data type. So relational at its heart, what we've uh, again covered many of these in previous webinars. So geospatial, for example, um, time series, JSON, key value, full text search engine, uh, Lucene. And uh, I think there's going to be part of the announcement that we have for the iceberg event. Uh, there's going to be some announcement around Lucene as well. And vectors, okay, which we've already mentioned. So vector support has been there uh, as from the previous slide in 2017. Better support this year, dedicated vector type, ANN indexing, all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, I'd highly recommend, you know, go and have a look at the documentation. There are examples. And again, we've covered this uh, a lot in previous webinars as well. So that's a great way to uh, get up to speed. And, and again, one question we are sometimes asked, you know, how is single store compared to other products such as Pinecone, Weaviet, uh, ChromaDB, and so on? Uh, and so if you look at this so far, you can see that, you know, we are much more than just a pure vector database, although you could use single store in that mode. But typically within an enterprise environment, I mean, you're going to want to do a lot more. And this is really where the product comes into its own. And as far as performance uh, goes, and I know this is something people look for, uh, I spent six years doing performance in academia and, and look at the state of my head, okay, no hair. So this is the real result of having to do benchmarks, okay? You need to get them right and it needs to be balanced and fair. We have some work in the pipeline via third party uh, that actually, actually doing performance benchmarking for us. I think those results will be available in the near future as part of a blog post or a report that we will make available on our website. And then lastly, as you can see, just along the top there, there's a whole range of uh, other things that you could do with the technology in terms of where you use it. Um, the dashboard is pretty cool as well. Again, whatever is your favorite technology, whether it's Tableau or something else, easily plugged in using JDBC. Uh, I mention always that I like Metabase simply because it's a, a single jar file, just download it, and within two or three minutes, I can be creating pie charts and uh, bar charts and so on. And uh, so that gives you the nice kind of overall picture of all of the you know wide range of capabilities that the product has. And so uh, you know this is far more than what a single product can do. And then again, the benefit for you as a developer is that you learn a single product. The benefit for you as a business person is that you save your money, okay? Your return on investment is improved. You lower your total cost of ownership. Single product can handle the wide range of uh, use cases and uh, uh, functionality. And with that, I will step down now and hand it over to Rohit. And so I'll be there. Uh, although I'll go dark, I will be answering questions or doing my best to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Rohit. Thank you so much, Akmal. I, I appreciate that. So let's get into it, guys. Um, first, what I'm going to do is explain what are knowledge graphs. Then we'll go a little bit in more in depth into what single store is and how we do what we do. And uh, we'll finally end off with a demo and then a Q&A session. So let's go ahead and start. So what are knowledge graphs? So let's first start off with a block of text, right? And in this case, I've written out a paragraph. Cows and dogs are good examples of animals. Cows eat herbs, which are plants. Both plants and animals count as living things. It's a very simplistic paragraph, um, not too complicated. A knowledge graph essentially extracts entities and relationships from this paragraph and represents this text data as a graph. So you can see the entities that are present in our paragraph are cows, dogs, animals, herbs, plants, and living things. And we've listed out the relationships between those objects, between those entities below. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see how we've represented this as a graph, right? We have our entities as nodes and our relationships between the entities as edges to our graph. So that's essentially what a knowledge graph is. Right? Your nodes represent your entities, your edges represent relation, uh, relationships, and your nodes and edges are labeled with you know, names, types, and other forms of information. So this is essentially where knowledge graphs come from. Right, You have your block of text that'll contain your entities and relationships, and you can extract that. So the question becomes, why are these knowledge graphs gaining interest? Well, the first point is that LLMs can create knowledge graphs, right? And fundamentally, this is 
this is what an LLM is kind of built to do. It's built to understand text and figure out what the important things in that text are. So it knows what entities are present and the semantic meaning of those entities, but it also understands the relationship between different entities. So for example, it understands the relationship between dogs and huskies. It understands the relationship, you know, it, it's basically built to understand all of those different kinds of relationships. So you can use an LLM to build a knowledge graph. And, you know, of course, today I'll show you a very simplistic example of, of building a knowledge graph from an LLM. But once you have your knowledge graph, you can use the knowledge graph to perform RAG. And this retrieval augmented generation, RAG, happens without vectors. Now, of course, you still can use vectors, and there are ways, there are ways you can use them, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. But at the end of the day, um, once you have your knowledge graph, your retrieval augmented generation process doesn't require you to use vectors. So the question you may ask is, where are these um, knowledge graphs most useful? And you know, just going just going back to the graph in your head, you can you can just imagine that um, whenever you're asking questions that require aggregations or multi-hop relationships between different entities. So for example, going from herbs to plants to living things, um, that's that's essentially where where knowledge graphs become a useful representation of the data. Now, in recent days, of course, you've probably seen that a bunch of new types of databases, new types of graph databases have come up specifically to answer these questions of how do you store graph data and how do you optimize for um, how do you optimize for storing this graph data? Well, I'm here to tell you that uh, your SQL databases can can query graphs too. And this is simply through the capabilities of joins, recursive CTEs, and so on. And I've uh, I, I've built a simple example in single store, um, which doesn't include a recursive CTE, but of course you can imagine that it's just as simple to create a, a query that takes advantage of that. So we'll see this in action with single store. And like I mentioned earlier, you can tag nodes with vectors, with text and other properties and search on those. So one common use case for, for vectors, for example, let's, let's go, actually go back to our, our knowledge graph over here is for entity resolution. So for example, if I had dogs um, as one of my nodes, and then I had a separate piece of the knowledge graph, which represents animals that, uh, that humans domesticated, and within that it contained dogs. Essentially, you can identify that those two nodes are the same by utilizing vectors. So that's that's a simple example of how you could how you could use um, vectors and other such properties for entity resolution. And there, there are ways to do that. Awesome. So let me get into the second piece here. Uh, who is single store? And you know, already Akmal gave you a very, very good overview of who single store is. But to give you the modern state of single store, we are a data platform in which you can transact, analyze, and contextualize data in real time. So let's dive into each of these three and kind of understand where we, um, where we live in this space. So when it comes to transactions, like Akmal mentioned, single store has super fast ingest pipelines to bring in your data in real time. We're talking on the order of milliseconds to microseconds for your, for your transactions, which means you can scale up to millions of events per second. The way we can do this is that single store is a distributed SQL database, and these pipelines take advantage of the high level of parallelism that you get from that. Furthermore, single store is horizontally scalable, which means that your pipelines can, again, take advantage of the high level of parallelism you get. When it comes to the analytical piece, um, single store, again, supports columnar data. Um, which means that you can perform analytics over vast amounts of data. We're talking on the scale of petabytes of data with sub 100 millisecond response time. So again, in that near real time range. Um, like you saw on the, uh, on the graph from earlier, single store supports many different data types from JSON to um, you know, geospatial time series, your regular relational data, vector data, and so on, which allows you to perform unstructured data analytics as well as structured data analytics. And finally, when it comes to um, your, your, your vectors, single store again has had vector support since 2017. 
Um, we've supported semantic search since then. And this year, of course, we've released our approximate nearest neighbor indexing as well as the vector data type. So this basically allows vectors to live within single store as first class citizens. But combining vector search with the unstructured data analytics through keyword search allows you to do something in single store called hybrid search. So this is, this is something that where essentially you combine your vector search with a keyword search, and it gives you more contextual respond, uh, results um, for your query than you would get from a simple vector search. So that's kind of the three main points of single store. We're a data platform in which you can perform transactions at scale, analytics at scale, and vector search all for your all for your different types of applications that can be built today. And again, just to just to reiterate this, single store can be deployed on-prem in the cloud, so any of the major cloud providers and in hybrid environments. So let me go to the next slide. And I'll kind of explain a little bit of how single store works. So essentially you bring in your data through a data pipeline. And the first layer that your data is ingested to in single store is the memory layer. This means that your data is immediately queryable for your apps. And since it is ingested into memory, um, the transactions, your, your you know, inserts, updates, and deletes happen at a very, very uh, fast frequency. So we're talking on the millisecond scale. As more data comes in, your data is then committed to persistent cache as columnar segments. Um, and this, is, this gives you two capabilities here. One is fast analytics over petabytes of data. Um, this is what gives you that sub 100 millisecond response times on your analytical queries. But also on the other end, this is what reduces your total cost of ownership of your data. And finally, of course, single store does commit your data to cloud object storage and we have um, algorithms that push and pull data from cloud object storage, which basically gives you access to this unlimited bottomless data storage. So um, on the right-hand side, you'll see your traditional distributed database concepts. You have your end users querying your application. Um, since single store is a distributed database, those queries will be sent to the master aggregators where they are split up and divided and sent to the leaf nodes where they where these subqueries are compiled. The results are then sent back to the aggregators where they're put together uh, into a final result and sent back to the users. So that is a very, very quick and dirty overview of what single store is and how we do what we do. So let's take a look at retrieval augmented generation with single store. And I'll specifically talk about this in the context of graph databases. So when you have your Gen AI application, your end user is going to be asking a question to this Gen AI application. Now what's going to happen is typically, you're going to have to query three different types of systems. You're going to have to query your knowledge graph to retrieve the, to retrieve the contextual information um, you're going to have to query your OLAP and OLTP databases to also include other bits of information that would be alongside your, your entities and relationships. You're going to have to bring all of that back to your application layer, stitch the responses together, and send that to your LLM as context. Now, again, this is something where it's not a very simple architecture, and you're really only as fast as your slowest component. So... The questions that you'll have to ask yourself on this are, can your graph database scale with your knowledge graph? Can your OLAP and OLTP system scale with your, you know, with your users and with your concurrency? Um, can these scale with the volume of data that you're trying to ingest into your system? And finally, are you capable of, of actually hitting the speed that you need for an end-to-end -end application to give you responses in real time? So those are all the questions that you'll have to ask when building this type of application with you know, a specialty graph database. Let's take a look at what happens when you try and build this type of application with single store. So with single store, again, you have your end user asking a question, but now with a single query, you can search and retrieve all the contextual information for your from your knowledge graph. This is because all of the information present for your for the for the uh, context for your LLM is present in your single store database, 
And again, this all this context will be sent to the LLM and your responses will be sent back to the user. So this is this is kind of how you would how you can build these these knowledge graphs in single store. So let me go ahead and show you, right? Let's take a look at knowledge graph rag with single store. So here's the setup, right? We have a large block of text about Super Mario Brothers. Now, I chose this mainly because this is one of the one of the video games that I haven't played. It's a very controversial statement to make, but I actually have not played this game before. Um, so I want to know information about this. So I've taken a large block of text about Super Mario Brothers from Wikipedia. And I have two goals for this demo. The first is to extract this into a knowledge graph using an LLM. The way that I've done that is through ChatGPT. I essentially, I essentially prompted the LLM to create a knowledge graph from this, from this data. The second goal, of course, is to build a RAG application on top of this. I want to query this knowledge graph using the capabilities of my system. So in this case, the single store has support for full text search. So I'm going to query this knowledge graph using full text search. Now, this is something that's highly extensible in single store. Right, I can combine this full text search with a vector search across entities for a more contextual response. I can combine it with any other types of filtering if I had more labels on my um, entities and relationships. So some of the topics covered here are, you know, extraction of knowledge graphs from LLMs and querying graph data in single store. Awesome. So let me go ahead and uh, move into the architecture. And this is the architecture that we're going to see today. So we have a bunch of input text data. We send this into an LLM, in this case, ChatGPT, to generate the knowledge graph. That knowledge graph is then sent into the single store database. On the other hand, we have our end user who's going to be asking a question, um, which is basically a search query. Uh, the search query is going to be executed in single store. The results are then going to be sent to the LLM. Uh, to generate a natural language response, which will then be sent back to the user. So this is the architecture we're seeing today. Um, but let me go ahead and show you uh, what some of the pieces are um, within single store, right? So we're so the question first, of course, is how do we so store these knowledge graphs in single store? And the second question is how do we query these knowledge graphs? Well, here's the schema and the queries. On the left-hand side, we have a table for the entities and a table for the relationships. The entities table contains the name of the entity, the type of the entity, and a full text index on the name. This essentially allows us to run those full text searches. And of course, you can imagine, given that single store has support for all these other different data types, we can add more labels. We can add a timestamp for when this entity was, uh, was added to the knowledge graph. We can add other information like a geography point, where this entity is located and so on. Again, same thing in the table uh, for relationships, we have uh, an ID column, the from entity ID to entity ID um, and the type, which is essentially the name of the relationship. And we've added another full text index over the type, which allows us to search over this. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see that we have this query, which allows us to query our knowledge graph. And essentially what we're doing is we are trying to match our, we're trying to match our input question. So this is going to be the natural language question that I type into my, uh, which I send to my database. We're trying to match that using a full text search against either the from entities or the two entities. And we're just joining that to the relationships table to extract all of the information we're going to need to provide to the LLM as context. So let me go ahead and show you guys that application. So you can see it's a very common um, chat interface and I have information about uh, Super Mario Brothers. And again, this is something that I haven't played, but I do know I am aware of some of the characters that are present in this video game. So let's go ahead and ask uh, who is um, Princess Peach? Um, I'm not I'm not really aware of who Princess Peach is, but let's go ahead and see what we can get from this. So you can see over here we have our information. Um, Princess Toadstool, commonly known as Princess Peach, is a character fe featured in the video game, blah, blah, blah. So this 
is essentially being fed into the into the LLM as context, right? Now, let me ask a question about something uh, about a a character which doesn't have much context in my knowledge graph. So I believe that character is Bowser. So let's go tell me about Bowser. And let's see what the response is going to be. So we've gotten some information. Bowser, also known as King Koopa, is a character within the context provided. The information indicates that Bowser and King Koopa are the same entity. Um, yeah. So you can see that there's not too much too much information present in this in this knowledge graph about Bowser. But now, um, let's go ahead and ask a question about something that's definitely not going to be part of the context. Um, I'll say, tell me about the Winter Olympics Olympics in 2022. And let's see what we get over here. So you can see I've still built my, my RAG application so that if there's nothing present in the context, it's not going to do any sort of hallucinations. This was basically just from prompt engineer. But let's go ahead and uh, take a look at single store directly. So this is our data in single store, right? We have three tables in our database called Mario test. And the three tables are chat messages to store the chat history, uh, the entities table, and the relationships table. And like I mentioned earlier, our entities table is exactly how I described it. Our relationships table is exactly how I described it. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some, uh, let's take a look at the result set that we get from our um, queries. So you can see that this is a fairly small knowledge graph. Um, I, I just have about 68 entities and maybe around 123 relationships. But let's go ahead and you know run the query that I told you I was running um, and kind of see what the result set looks like in single store. So I'm going to, uh, first of all, I need to go to the correct workspace. Um, so this is going to be the knowledge graph workspace. And I'm going to look at the Mario test database. And I'm going to run this query. So let's go ahead and see what results we get. And you can see over here, the result set looks like this. This is what we're providing to the LLM as context. Right on the right hand side, you can see we have our full text score, um, and on the left hand side, we can you can see we have all of the information that we need from that. Okay, awesome. So that brings me to the end of the demo. Um, so let me go back into slideshow mode, and to the end of the presentation. So I think right now I think we can start answering questions. That was such or, an I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you take over. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how have you not played Mario Kart? <laughs> Come on, that's actually super controversial. Yeah, I, I've had to answer many questions in my life about this, but I guess it never it never it never um kind of caught my caught my fancy. I like plants versus zombies. That's my favorite. I, oh, yeah. I don't play the Mario <laughs> games. <laughs> that blew up, like you know, in mid 2013, to like I was in school back then, so we used to come back and like just be glued to our screen and like keep on playing that. I was so yeah, that's just there. So we can start with our Q and A session. Uh, everyone, please feel free to uh drop in all your questions, and uh, we'll have Rohit take them up. So we have questions from uh Vinny. Uh, she says, did you observe better accuracy in reporting numbers and extracting data when using knowledge graphs as context? So then she says that ChatGP didn't perform adequately querying and summarizing SQL data, uh, data for my use case. So she's working on creating a paragraph, uh, a graph for my relational data for another task. So like, what do you think? Like, can you comment on this basically? Yeah, yeah, that was a that's a great question, Winnie. First of all, um, just to go back to sorry, just to go back um a little bit, sorry, I, I put a lot of slides, but essentially, um, knowledge graphs are really good for handling questions about um, 
like relationships between objects. So for example, if you had some sort of hierarchical relationship, um, or if you had some sort of, if it wasn't hierarchical, it would be like a serial relationship between objects. That's where knowledge graphs are really, really good at answering those types of questions. On the other hand, if you had uh, information, or at least if you had queries where you're looking for the semantic meaning of text, that's where I'd recommend you use rag with vectors. So it's two different use cases, right? On one hand, it's, it's you know, whether or not the objects are have some sort of relationship, like a hierarchical hop type of relationship versus whether they have some sort of semantic relationship. All right, so we have one question from Robert. Uh, they say, please explain full text score. Oh, uh, great question. The full text score is essentially the, the it, it depends on the scoring algorithm used, but we have an implementation of the uh, C-Lucene library, which essentially calculates that full text score. So it's essentially a matching of the keywords um, based on a certain algorithm. I'm not sure which one we use, but it's it's a matching of the keywords based on a, a certain algorithm that are present in the input and the uh, the the field you're searching over. So just going back to that slide over here, that score is again calculated by weighting half of um, what the entity names against the input. And yeah, that's basically what we're doing. Uh, all right. So Akmal, I see you're typing uh, answers the like, which is can we use graph query languages like Cypher here? So do you want to take this up live? Yeah, I, I was, I mean, Cypher is, uh, what I know is originally from Neo4j. Uh, it's not open source as far as I know, but it's an open spec. Uh, it's a specification. And I, I mean, in this example, Rohit didn't use it. Uh, and I don't know if we support it directly or could do, uh, given that it's a, an open spec. I think there are implementations out there. And correct me if I'm wrong, you know, if, if people know other than this, please uh, chime in. Um, but in this particular uh, example, I think we we are we don't have the the integration with the cipher. Um, Rohit, any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I mean, it, given that it's an open spec and it's widely available out there, uh, you the examples that you've shown are SQL. Obviously, that's our strength and that's the uh, focus for our technology. But um, I, I'm assuming that if there's enough, you know, information in terms of API and access and so on, in theory, it could be possible to use it. Yeah, it could be. Um, there are a couple of things. I think, first of all, Single Store has a GraphQL playground that you can play around with um, that basically just rewrites queries from, from GraphQL to, to SQL. Um, but at the end of the day, the question, the question really is, um, what are you willing to kind of tolerate? So when I, when I say that, I mean, are you willing to just add another layer to your tech stack? and have essentially introduce a whole nother component of data movement between one place to another. Um, so that's that's essentially um, what it what it comes what it comes down what it comes down to. But uh, I'm not sure if you can query single store directly in in graph GraphQL. Yeah, I think there was um, there, there is a, a kind of a graph implementation from Apache. Uh, name slips my mind for the moment, and I was looking at it a while back. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it has been implemented on relational technology as well. So, you know, there is stuff out there. It's just a question of uh, with the all the built-in capabilities that Single Store provides. And you, you mentioned this yourself, Rohit, in terms of the uh, uh, recursive CTEs, for example, which will allow you to do these kind of graph-like operations, uh, plus the... Uh, Lucene full text engine plus the uh, semantic search for RAG, you know, you can combine all of these to achieve the end results without having to add something additional beyond that. Although if you favor some particular technology, you might be very interested in adding that support. And, and I think if people are interested, you know, by all means, make that suggestion to us. And uh, if engineering field is, is, is enough demand, it's something we will definitely look at. Uh, yeah, Yukti, you wanted to take some of those additional questions? Uh, maybe uh, pick pick something for uh, see if uh, there right. seems to be so, a few uh, in, the, in the queue there. So uh, we have a question regarding single store from Amrish Kumar. 
He says that do we have any performance benchmark for million rows or billion rows ingestion? Um, is this billion rows ingestion of vector data or just any sort of data? Um, they have not exactly specified that in the okay, question. Okay. So you can just take up both. I feel like maybe we can start with the vector data type first. Yeah, and I, I definitely think that was the that was the context in which that was asked. Yeah. But um, to answer that, we do have a benchmarking blog which is already out, um, and I believe uh, we are very very soon going to release a research paper about single store, which uh, should be publicly available. Um, but essentially, it's it's benchmarking against all the popular vector database vendors for index build time, for ingestion, for recall and accuracy, and so on. So that, that will definitely be coming soon. Yeah. Um, when it comes to benchmarking single stores, um, conventional ingestion for relational data for different data types, um, I believe we already do have that, but maybe Akmal, you can, you can add a little bit more flavor to that. Yeah, I think Rohit, we, we've done, and I think it's in one of our blogs over the last couple of years, there was something about a billion row benchmark. And then uh, I think we went a step further, trillion rows uh, ben benchmark, just to up the ante because everybody else was doing a billion row as well. So we, we'll try and find those links, okay? Is that, I'm, I'm sure we've got those somewhere. Um, I, I mean, normally they're just the search on our blog site should reveal those, but, um, yeah, I mean, the product is very scalable as you, as you saw from the architectural diagrams that Rohit showed, I mean, it's scale out architecture. Okay. And you've got these aggregator nodes and leaf nodes, and there is kind of redundancy there as well. You know, if a particular node goes down, you, you've got copies of your data as stored elsewhere as well. You can still run those queries. And that is one of the nice things about having this capability plus the 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 power and the strength of SQL that you know you have this kind of relational algebra if you like and leave the optimizer to do the hard work essentially you ask the question and let the system figure out the best way to get that data for you um, regardless of whether it's local or distributed it will figure out the the optimal way to to retrieve that for you and you know we have customers uh, there isn't a slide in Rohit's presentation this time, but we have customers doing very demanding and building demanding applications out there requiring, you know, sub-second uh, response or storing massive quantities of data. And so, you know, all of this is possible. All right. So we can take a one more question. Uh, so we have a question from... Uh, so, Vijay Kumar, they say, do you have KG examples on geospatial data? Uh, that is a great question. As of right now, we do not have examples for knowledge graphs on geospatial data. That is something we can absolutely build out. Um, and that is actually something I was planning on working on, um, knowledge graphs with, with multiple different data types. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. We will we will definitely have an announcement when that when that uh, demo when that notebook is available. All right. So uh, that's actually a very good question. So keep those more of those coming in and we'll take it up right now. So uh, one more question from Amit. Uh, is there any comparative study between AWS Neptune and AWS deployed single store cluster performance? Why would one choose a, a Neptune uh, over single store or like single store over Neptune? That's a great question. Um, yeah. I, I think it's one of these things is very difficult. Obviously, we, we were going to say, you know, choose single star. <laughs> you know, it's uh, probably the answer you'd expect us. But uh, I mean, if you are using other technologies out there, competitor technologies, and perhaps you're looking at single store and thinking, well, you know, this looks interesting. How would single store perform against this? Uh, the easiest and quickest way is just to reach out to us. We will uh, get technical resources, people to talk to you, you know, discuss your problem, kind of things that you're trying to do, um, and figure out the best way to assist you. Uh, I mean, off the cuff and off, uh, you know, just giving you an answer um, in this kind of webinars is a bit difficult because we don't know your data sets, the query patterns that you have, what, how, how you want to scale. Uh, there is all sorts of issues there. And it may well be that in some cases we are not the right fit. Okay, that that happens. Okay, um, it, we don't necessarily claim that we are going to be 
the perfect solution in every single case. The, but you know, by and large, given the wide range of capabilities that the product has, chances are that we would we would be very competitive in many situations and and far better. But there may be some cases that we are not. Uh, I mean, that's natural. Um, part of life and part of business, but the easiest thing to do. I mean, just reach out to us uh, and then we can discuss your requirements in more detail yeah, and okay. find out what, what it is exactly you want to do. To our team. Yeah, sorry, Akmal, you were saying something. No, no, yes, yes, please go ahead, Yuthi. Yeah, I think yeah, it's just, te team at singlestore.com. Yeah, exactly. Uh, please feel free to reach out to anyone uh, on the team and like we will assist you with your use case and uh, then we can, hopefully we can build something around that. And uh, so, uh, we have one more question from Prince Yadav. Is it possible to deploy it on-prem to which I believe the answer is yes, right? All right, so I can take up one more question. Uh, so uh, let me just choose. Uh, we have one. Uh, so uh, Sanya Mobroy asks, are these notebooks accessible? Uh, do you mean single store notebooks or like? Uh, Rohit's code. Uh, Rohit, will you be able to make your code available to us? All right. Uh, so there you go. Uh, we have the answer for that. So. Um, yeah, I see the question. One... That... Oh, right. oh, sorry, Yukti. Please, I, I, I apologize. Uh, I think we've got a little bit of time still. Uh, Rohit yes. did, did an awesome presentation. If and and showed the car and it finished early. I, you know, I always talk too much in mind. I always go to the wire, but there's a couple of questions here. So uh, Marcello asked the question, is there currently integration with Langchain or is it planned for the future? I mean, we do have integration with Langchain. Yes, there is actually a, a page on our website. Um, uh, and if you look at the Langchain documentation as well, uh, you will see that Single Store is one of the supported products out there. And my recommendation is, uh, wherever possible, use Langchain. If you look, if you're asking specifically about the graph and the knowledge rag that uh, Rohit showed, I mean that's a separate issue. But the general um, gist of what I'm trying to tell you is that yes, we do have Langchain integration. It's been there for a while, um, and Langchain will save you an awful lot of time and headache, and, and it, because it manages the low-level plumbing for you, does lots of things for you frees you uh, up as a developer in terms of your time and you focus on the business problem. And if you want some examples, by the way, just uh, recently over the last couple of weeks on DZone, for example, I published two articles, one showing how to run Olama uh, locally with Langchain, and then the second example showing how to run Olama locally without Langchain. And you see the difference because in the second example, I have to write all the SQL code myself. I have to worry about the indexing. I have to worry about the access, all of those things. Whereas the Langchain solution is very short. It's like 10 lines of code, literally. I mean, that is the, uh, you know, because it manages all of that for you behind the scenes. That's really cool, Akmal. Uh, so uh, we can actually take up one more question. Uh, just keep the questions coming and we have some time. So this is actually really good. Thanks, Rohit, for finishing up so fast. Uh, so we have one more question from Bhaskar Jeet. Uh, they say, how do you make sure that the output of the graph rag is uh, grounded and LLM is not using its own internal knowledge to generate the output? At the end of the day, we are just passing entities to the LLM to generate the output. How do you make sure that the LLM uses the relationship from the knowledge graph and not its own internal knowledge to of the entity to generate the output? So, Akmal, if you can take up this question, or Rohit, if you're comfortable taking up, uh, anyone can go forward and just answer this question. Yeah, I, so I'll have a bit of a stab, but Rohit probably is a better place to answer it. I mean, the thing is, with hallucinations, there's a couple of things that you could do to mitigate uh, typically, when you're building these rag-like applications, there are some things that you can have control over in terms of when you're calling the LLM, for example. Temperature is the most common one that will give you uh, some level of confidence in the answer. I mean, you set it to a value so that it, it, and you can tell it, OK, you know, here is the role that you're going to assume. And if you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer, okay? Rather than trying to come back and give me something that you, you think I might be looking for, you make the instructions as specific as possible. Remember, treat it like a five-year-old child. Give it specific instructions, set of rules, set of uh, sort of processes and steps that it, it can follow 
in the event that it, it, it does not know the answer. Okay, so there are things that you can do to mitigate that and have some control over. Uh, and those are very, very useful. I mean, these are simple things that you can do in the first instance. Great. So, uh, okay, uh, we can take one more question moving ahead. So, we have a comment and a question from Pablo. Uh, I'm interested in using GPT RAGS and single store for business uh, based on series of the webinars. Thank you so much, Pablo. Uh, where do we get more information in setting this up? Uh, like RAGS, multi agents, those who are new to this arena. So, Akmal, please help him with this. Okay, so what I would strongly recommend uh, is obviously reach out to us, team, T-A-M, at singlestore.com in the first instance. So you may well be talking to Rohit. Um, he might be that technical guy that you speak to because he, you know, of his awesome knowledge in this space and because he works with customers. The other place that I would strongly recommend that people go to, and I, I make this recommendation simply, I mean, they have nothing to do with us. Look at the website deeplearning.ai. Okay. So, Andrew, who's the guy, one of the founders of Coursera, he runs a couple of these startup companies, and deeplearning.ai regularly, uh, almost on a weekly basis, they have these short courses. They are free. Okay. Typically one hour in duration. So, you watch a bunch of videos. There's a whole series of notebooks as well they provide. And there's been a lot of focus on agentic and RAG and, and this kind of thing in the re, in the very recent past. That's a great way to just improve your knowledge and skill in the area. And remember that at the end of the day, as long as there is some kind of requirement in terms of integration with an LLM, for example, or maybe even not, uh, there are, as Rohit mentioned, there are other ways that you can create embeddings without the use of, a, a, of a, a, you know some kind of large language model. Uh, sometimes the, these things occur naturally. Uh, sometimes you can just generate them. There's many ways that you could deal with that. And so uh, it, 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 I think it's the case that just brush up, improve your own skill and knowledge in the space, You know, take whatever free training you can. And then if you have some specific and detailed requirement, come to us. We'll be more than happy to discuss it with you. Perhaps we can go through the process of identifying uh, you know, proof of concept. There is a, a process in terms of getting some workshops done. We can arrange those with you, some technical uh, enablement, for example, on our technology, and then work through some examples with you. So we can do that as well. And, and all of that is possible. All right. So, uh, uh, Rohit, the next question is for you. Uh, we have a question from Philippa, right? She says, if you want to ingest, say, thousands or hundreds of documents, to then query to find links between a person and a company, etc. How do you stop it extracting too much information with it with the tedious links uh, or uninteresting links? Uh, how do you get it to aggregate similar links and relationships? Uh, we want to continuously add huge amounts of data, but are unable to find links uh, and mass. So that's a great question. Um, there are a couple of approaches that I can immediately think of. Um, the first thing, of course, is if you have hundreds of thousands of documents, um, you would probably need some sort of architecture setup, which allows you to continuously evaluate the strength of those links, right? So there are algorithms you can use to uh, kind of extract the strength of the relationships and how often it's reinforced in your data between two different entities. Um, and one way you can do that is essentially through figuring out which Entities are close to each other, either through a smaller knowledge graph, creating subsets of the knowledge graph and finding relationships between other subsets of the knowledge graph. Or you can use some other type of large language models, embeddings to create um, kind of entity resolution type queries, which allow you to associate two objects which don't have a direct connection between them together. And based on that, you can build, you can essentially drop out certain um, certain connections which don't have the strength that you want. It's all about creating metrics for yourself. And essentially all this amounts to is creating a feedback loop, which allows you with scoring for the strength of relationships between entities. I think right. one of the, just a quick comment there, uh, you see. So, uh, um, and uh, um, Rohit mentioned this. So I think it's very important to kind of understand the, uh, the domain as well. I remember many years ago, uh, there was, uh, and I can't remember where, whether it was written up or it was just something that I heard in a discussion or a, uh, or a presentation, um, but there was um, a, an airline 
uh, a well-known airline in the United Kingdom. And then they were discussing, you know, how they identified, for example, customers. And it, what it tended to end up was they've got like 30 different definitions of what is a customer. So you can see that in that case, you know, uh, I, I may be a customer, you know, in terms of I fly with them, but they've got other customers, other types of customers. OK, so again, there's the, the point that Rohit was making in terms of the strength of the relationship and what it what what it means to you and what you're what you're trying to kind of extract out. So all of these things have a bearing on the end result, obviously. Um, so it, this is why it's very important, I think, to and we had this with the. Um, uh, Tom Ye's uh, webinar earlier this week. You know, it's great not to use the technology, but just sit down with your brain, a piece of paper uh, and a pen and just write this all out and think to yourself on paper what it is you're trying to do and map that out. And that's a great way to get your ideas down uh, and, you know, any kind of initial starting point. So, <clears throat> so there's actually there's actually a technical term for that these days. It's called human in the loop feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so <coughs> that was actually a very good session you guys can go ahead and check it from our resources pages it's available on demand so if that uh, whenever professor tom is there it's like a very uh like those sessions are super super popular so uh i think we can close up because we just have three minutes and uh, in the best interest of time uh for anyone's questions that have not been answered, we will follow up with everyone via email. So thanks again, Rohit. That was such an amazing session. And I really enjoyed, but I'm very surprised by the fact that you did not play Mario Kart and you did a demo on that. <laughs> so just that it was it was really fun. So all right. So we just have quick notes before I announce today's raffle winner. So all right. Uh, Thank you, Rohit and Atmal. Uh, this was very interesting. So just a reminder for everyone those who's attending and have, maybe has joined late, they've got amazing sessions that are coming up on June 17th. We have uh, Building Secure AI Healthcare Apps with AWS Private Cloud. The QR code and the link is there on your screen. On June 18th, we have LLMs of uh, web analytics chat with your data. And on June 26th, we have the Unfreeze Your Iceberg data for real-time AI product launch. So if any of these topics are interesting to you, please feel to uh, free to RSVP right now. I hope to see you all there. So the announcement that everyone's been waiting for today. Uh, so the raffle winner goes to Shushant Mondal. He's the VP Enterprise Architecture at Genpact. Congratulations, sir, and thanks for joining. So if this is not you, uh, please do not give up. We are going to announce one more AirPods and Meta's Ray-Ban winner by the end of the day. For anyone who has tried out today's demo during the session and has signed up, so you can still see the link or the QR code for anyone those who joined late. Please uh, feel free to sign up right now and be eligible and be entered to win. I thank Rohit for today's presentation and demo and thanks everyone for joining. We really value our time, time and energy and uh, have a great rest of the day. Good evening, good morning, good night, wherever you are and take care everyone. Thanks again. Bye-bye.